I greet you, ladies and gentlemen, as I present to you uh, this lecture on central banking and the globalization of financial markets. Uh, I trust you were able to follow my previous lecture on central bank independence. If there is need for me to send additional material to you via email or via WhatsApp, I'm going to do so. So without wasting time, I'm going to dive straight into the material that I have for you today. So what we are looking at today is central banking and the, the corporatization of financial markets. And uh, it's, a, it's a lecture which comprises 27 slides. And I hope to finish this in less than 30 minutes. So this lecture is part of the module on central banking and monetary economics, whose course code is CPA 5213. It's a master's degree course that I'm teaching this semester. And uh, I hope that um, as we work with the students that I'm teaching, they are benefiting from the lectures that are I'm affording them. So it's a quite a straightforward syllabus uh, which we are covering. And hopefully, the students that I'm teaching, the Master of Science in Banking and Financial Economics, will be able to master the content within the prescribed time. So tomorrow, I'm going to present topic number four. It's the longest topic in this course outline. Uh, the presentation will be in two parts. The first part, I'm going to, to present monetary policy in theory and practice. I've already done that. So I've already introduced the money and the financial system the role of money in the economy in the monetary policy according to different schools of thought. thought. And there are certain stylized effects like a monetary policy. Uh, when we look at uh, issues such as volatility, psychicality, and persistence in macroeconomic time series, and all of that stuff, that's what I'll be presenting in the short run and the long run, Phillips curve model. Uh, and then the money monetary policy in the open economy, the ISLMPP model or the Mundell Fleming model. So the presentation will be in two parts. The first part will be introductory, whilst the second part will be delving into more rigorous material and also empirical uh, studies on monetary policy. And then I, it's my plan that on Friday, tomorrow, I'm going to finish uh, that section on monetary policy in theory and practice. But back to what we're covering today. Today, we're looking at central banking and the globalization of financial markets. When we are looking at globalization, we have to start by defining financial globalization. There is the definition of globalization uh, just in general the globalization of arts, the globalization of media, and so on. But what we are looking at uh, under this module is the globalization of financial markets, which is also called financial globalization. So this involves uh, advances that okay when it comes to, when we are looking at financial infrastructure and architecture in a country, sub-region, region, subcontinent, continent, or even the whole world, the integration of financial markets uh, is what we'll be looking at. Uh, as these advances are witnessed in the financial infrastructure and the architecture, 
an advanced commercial segment infrastructure implies that debtors and creditors tend to be able to work in clearer, more competitive and effective financial markets. Under conditions of financial market globalization, challenges of unbalanced statistics are reduced and levels of credit, they tend to increase. Because when there is globalization, it's very difficult for arbitrators to withhold information from certain players in the market because information becomes freely available. So financial market globalization, it has been found in numerous studies that it reduces adverse selection or adverse choice and moral threat, which is also called moral hazard in corporate finance. There are, however, topics which are associated with the market, financial market globalization, also called financial globalization. And these topics are, are covered in the in the slides that are, are upcoming on slide number six. I'm going to correct that. I'd say it on the next slide, but on the next slide, we're covering something else. So it's on slide number six. It's on slide number one slide. On slide number six. Number six. That is where we are covering that on slide number six. So, so when we are looking at financial globalization, it's not a new phenomenon. However, over the past few years, economies have become increasingly integrated and there's been a significant increase of international trade and capital across national boundaries. The focus of international integration of economies is based on the appeal of a free global market with less trade barriers, which allows states to compete with one another. International organizations such as the World Trade Organization uh, facilitate the free flow of goods, capital and services, though economies such as uh, the United States of America and China, to a certain extent, have complained about the role of the World Trade Organization. But we know that at least on paper, TJ, the World Trade Organization exists to promote free trade among countries and also to facilitate international agreements, specifically international commodities and other types of agreements. When we are looking at the globalization of financial markets, it can also be defined as the grow, growing weight of finance in the global economy. And there are quite a number of definitions. According to Arrestis and Pasu, 2003, in page one of their work, financial globalization is the process by which financial markets of different countries are integrated or they become integrated. This is due to the free movement of finance between countries without any restrictions or when restrictions are removed. Restrictions may include trade, exchange rate, price, or political restrictions. According to Haywood, uh, 2011, page 21 of uh, the, the, the work, financial globalization is defined as a process through which sovereign states or nations are under mined by transnational actors. These transnational actors may be transnational corporations, transnational financial institutions, like your HSBC or Standard Chartered Bank or Barclays Bank, or even transnational not-for-profit organizations such as your UNDP, United Nations Development Program, your UNICEF and multilateral organizations. Uh, you have got uh, among NGOs also organizations like Plan International, World Division, and so on, which uh, tend to be associated with money movements of their own and accounting systems of their own. And then Pakwati 2004, page 10, defines financial globalization as a process through which national economies are integrated into the international economy 
through trade, direct foreign investment, short-term capital flows and flows of goods and services. And then the, the so we've got three working definitions or technical definitions. So we want to look at the benefits of uh, the globalization of financial markets. The first benefit is that the more rapid spreading of technological advances uh, is facilitated by the globalization of financial markets. The second benefit is that financial innovation becomes more pronounced. And uh, you know, financial entities in different countries are able to share technologies. And then the third uh, merit or benefit is that financial performance uh, improves to various parts of the globe. And then the fourth is that financial globalization in combination with good macroeconomic policies and good domestic governance appears to be conducive to growth. So financial globalization, it may also promote economic growth. So there is part of us. We know this has to be taken with a pinch of salt because there are also spillover effects that are easily um, felt by different economies when there is financial globalization. They are also believed to have facilitated greater diversification of portfolios and increased the size of markets. We are talking about uh, the benefits of uh, financial globalization, that uh, the, there is a greater diversification of portfolios and increased uh, size of the market. And then the topics or the three merits of financial market globalization is that fault lines in global financial markets may lead to credit crunches, which may easily spill over to other countries, like the uh, 2007 to early 2009 global financial crisis, which started as a subprime mortgage crisis in the United States of America, where mortgage-based lending uh, spawned a very serious global financial crisis. Asset bubbles may also re uh, resound, which may destabilize other macroeconomic variables in unregulated financial markets. So these integrated financial markets, the main challenge is that sometimes uh, what normally happens, it becomes very difficult for governments to control them because you'll be having a bank which has got branches in 20 countries. The question is whose law must that bank fall? If it is following multiple statutes, there's a strong possibility of that bank being used for maybe money laundering purposes, or maybe if I mention money laundering, I'll be mentioning an extreme, but the bank may have these money movements, especially if the bank is also involved in these cryptocurrencies and other activities like, uh, you know, trade in stock markets, offshore and onshore, it may lead to destabilization of macroeconomic variables in certain weak economies with shallow financial markets. And other problems that tend to result are irrational habits where people become exuberant and then they are just buying into money market positions uh, divorced from the fundamentals that are, are prevailing in the in the economic system or within the financial sector, and then there is adding up with speculative outbreaks and crashes. These things they tend to be related. Head it means a, a group of cattle or a group of animals. So adding up it is a situation where if a certain trend is started by someone or some people who are influential in a certain market segment, others, they tend to follow without analyzing the fundamentals that are inspiring such behavior. And then the financial system ends up being compromised and uh, the system may actually collapse, uh, all other things being constant. As financial systems tend global, individual governments no longer have policy instruments at their disposal. Uh, that can be said about the Zimbabwean economy, because the Zimbabwean economy is partially dollarized. 
if not de facto dollarized. From my perspective as an economist, the Zimbabwean economy, though, are still using the RRTGS dollar. It's a de facto dollarized economy. And because it is a de facto dollarized economy, one would, you know, understand and bear with the policymakers when they are not able to tame things like inflation, because what they have in their arsenal is not able to, to tame high powered money in the form of, uh, you know, this hot money supply, which come into the economy as foreign currency, most of which come through informal and semi-legal and illegal channels, so to speak. And then we have got the, the purchasing power parity theory. There's so many versions of it. There is the relative purchasing power parity theorem. There is the interest rate uh, parity theorem and so on. But we want to just look at the purchasing power parity theorem because it has got a, you know, a bearing on the globalization of financial markets. Or the globalization of financial markets may actually promote the workings of this purchasing power parity theorem. According to this theorem, this is an idea that goods in one country will cost the same as in another country once the exchange rates uh, are applied or equalized, so to speak. According to this theory, two currencies are at par when a, uh, the same basket of goods is valued in the same way in both countries. The source of this definition is investor petty. You can examine any elementary economics textbook, it will be having a, quite an expose or an exposition on the purchasing power parity theorem. The comparison of prices of identical items in different countries will determine the purchasing power parity rate. However, an, exempt, an exact comparison is difficult due to differences in things like uh, product quality, consumer attitudes, uh, social values and modes, economic conditions and so on, even political systems. Also purchasing power parity is a theoretical concept which may not be true in the real world, especially in the short term, even in the long run, given issues such as transport costs and weather conditions uh, and some of the factors which have been mentioned. According to empirical evidence, empirical evidence has shown that for many goods uh, and baskets of goods, PPP is not observed in the short run. And there is uncertainty over whether it applies even in the long run. So the dynamics of relative purchasing power parity, when we modify the absolute purchasing power parity theory or theorem, what do we come up with? According to the relative power parity theorem or concept, is essentially a dynamic form of the static purchasing power parity theorem, as it relates the change in two countries' inflation rates to the change in their exchange rate. So uh, in, the inflation rate is taken into account in exchange rate determination because you know money movements have got that nominal aspect which obviously factors in inflationary expectations prevailing in both economies whose currencies are actually being compared to each other to come up with an exchange rate. The theory holds that inflation will reduce the real, the real purchasing power of a nation's currency. I don't think this can be debated by anyone who did elementary economics at undergraduate level. It's known that inflation undermines the purchasing power of a currency, or the purchasing power of income, if I may put it that way. Thus, if a country has an annual inflation rate of 10%, that country's currency will be able to purchase 10% less real goods at the end of the year, because inflation will act as a, an implicit tax on the purchasing power of that currency. So if, say you have got a dollar, and uh, at the beginning of the year, when this inflation is starting, you will be able to purchase a dollar worth of goods. If a dollar worth of goods can be a basket or a particular commodity, at the end of the year, you will be able to purchase uh, 90 cents worth of goods, 
with the same amount of money, you still have a dollar, but the inflation rate of 10%, which has acted as an implicit tax, has sort of devalued your, your, your currency, the money that you are holding, the dollar that you are holding by 10%. So inflation is like an implicit tax of some sort. And this dynamic relative purchase in power parity concept takes into account inflation dynamics that are prevailing in an economy. So according to the relative purchase in power parity concept, it complements this the, the static or absolute uh, version of the purchase in power parity, which maintains that the exchange rate between two economies will be identical to the ratio of the price level for those two countries. This concept comes from the basic idea, which is known as the law of one price. This theory states that the real cost of a commodity must be the same across all countries after the consideration of the exchange rate. Of course, assuming away factors such as product quality, consumer attitudes, and economic conditions. Examples of the relative purchase in power parity theory. I've got a hypothetical example here. We suppose that over the next year, inflation causes average prices for goods in the United Kingdom to increase by 3%. In the same period, prices of, for products in Sweden in, increased by 6%. The point to note, we can say that Sweden has, a higher, has had a higher inflation than the UK since prices there have risen faster than have risen faster than those in in in, in UK by three points or three percent. So according to the concept of relative purchase power parity, that three point difference will drive a three point change in the exchange rate between the United Kingdom and Sweden. So we would expect the Swedish krona, which is the currency in Sweden, to depreciate at a at the rate of three percent per year, or that the UK pound should appreciate at the rate of three percent per year. If if the Swedish krona is is to stay the same, in other words, it doesn't depreciate or appreciate, then the UK pound must appreciate. But if the Swedish krona is depreciates by 3%, the UK pound must remain the same. If the Swedish krona appreciates by 2%, the British pound, I mean, if the Swedish krona depreciates by 2%, the British pound must appreciate by 1% to maintain that gap of 3%. So uh, the, the combinations, the possibilities, and the permutations that can be quite complex or convoluted, but the understanding is that there must be a gap of 3% in the exchange rates, such that when we are looking at the real change in the exchange rate, it will be just 3% between the two currencies. So acknowledgement, uh, it's globalization and financial markets, a speech by Malcolm T. Knight for what I'm going to present next. So only a few decades ago, long after Schumpeter, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter was a very influential Central European economist who undertook quite a lot of work on consumption theory, financial theory, and so on. Because economists long ago, they tended to be philosophers. So they would cover quite a lot of aspects, you see. So, but among other things that he teased out in some of his essays and treatises is the is advancements in financial markets and the introduction of financial instruments. We know that you, in reality, you can't introduce new financial instruments without advancing or globalizing financial markets. I'm going to share the slides, so there is no point in me reading what I've already summarized. So whilst it is often emphasized that globalization has consequences 
for the terms offered to attract foreign capital, it is le less frequently acknowledged that it also affects incentives for residents of a country to contribute to the development of financial assets at home. So this is what more recent works have focused on. So when we look at the 1980s, we realized that due to uh, you know, financial liberalization theories, which started to be advanced by, you know, uh, you know, financial economies such as Gali and Shaw in the 1970s. There was a, this move, this massive move towards capital account liberalization. Uh, so many economies, they started to liberalize their capital account, though, in the 1990s, uh, you know, some financial crisis erupted in naughty countries, uh, East Asia, Russia, and in Latin America, due to these liberalized, uh, you know, capital accounts, or due to the liberalization of capital markets. We know uh, the role that was played by speculators such as George Soros in the depreciation of uh, currencies such as the South Korean won and the Malaysian ringgit before certain measures were introduced to control the operation of financial markets. And also the role that was played by speculators in the, especially in the late 1990s, mid 1990s to the late 1990s in the depreciation even of the Russian ruble as well. So when you look at the aspect of financial market globalization, we also look at the aspect of new financial products. The global financial system of today is vastly more accessible to companies and households through the internet and also through financial instruments such as Visa card. I mean, financial uh, electronic banking means, financial electronic banking means uh, such uh, and financial products such as Visa cards, Master cards, Maestro, cryptocurrencies, and a host of other uh, platforms which have been mounted and have become very important recently, like your PayPal and so on. So, but over the past two, five years, the trade in credit risk transfer instruments such as credit default swaps and asset backed securities has made it possible for different players in the private sector and also in the not so private sector to share credit risk across geographical space or across different countries. Firms that are dispersed and houses that are dispersed are able to share credit risks and also to share credit benefits of transferring credit from one part of the world to another part of the world as financial markets have become more integrated there is a, a whole area a whole area of study on the impact of remittances we know remittances is just the income which is transferred from one place to another usually by people who originated from a certain country back to their mother country to support their relatives but uh, uh, the volumes have increased over time. Of course, the volumes, um, they, um, they are dwarfed by the volumes of transactions that take place in financial markets uh, each and every trading day when it comes to the buying and selling of financial instruments. And we, we have also had the you know mutual mutual funds or mutual fund companies that market equity funds to their global clients have also become very prominent uh, and there's also been growth uh, in equity portfolios in more than two dozen emerging economies matching and transition economies and this is one of the reasons why systemic risk. I mean, uh, there, there have been very serious spillovers of uh, crisis from one economy to another. 
as evidenced by what happened in the 2007 to early 2009 global financial crisis. The internationalization of finance or fi the financial processes has heightened the need for cross cooperation among those involved in, so in the supervision in supervision and those responsible for national financial infrastructures, which is why we have got the Basel Accords, which are not mentioned in this set of slides. We have got the Basel Accords and the different pillars, which are a requirement for virtually all banks or central banks to implement in order to minimize uh, the possibility of risks being transferred from one economy to another. So we've got uh, this global financial crisis, the global financial and economic crisis which I've been referring to. It's also courtesy of uh, this speech by Malcolm T. Knight, which I'm using as the source material in dissecting the central banking and the globalization of financial markets. Uh, his presentation is not the only source. There are so many sources. Some are very rigorous, but I chose this sort of meeting approach, which is not too technical, so that uh, we can just tease out certain key issues when it comes to globalization of financial markets. My presentation is by no means exhaustive, ladies and gentlemen. It's meant to tease out your interest, to, to, to trigger your interest, to pique your interest, uh, when you are looking at financial market globalization. And, uh, you know, in, in his presentation, Malcolm denied, said, given the narrow financial border between my home country and the United States, I am very aware of the relevance of these issues. What issues? The issues that uh, he was talking about, <clears throat> it's this globalization of uh, financial market processes. Because these notes, I compiled them from a speech that uh, 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 Malcolm denied often. And uh, he was general manager of the Bank of International Settlements. So the reason why I, I chose his speech and felt his speech is important is because the Bank of International Settlements works uh, in you know hand in hand in hand with central banks of virtually all countries to manage liquidity and to manage issues such as credit risk all other things being constant so i felt that this speech was from someone who is well informed about issues that impinge on the regulation of financial markets from a global perspective. So back to the global financial crisis. As I said, it emanated from the United States of America. Uh, and its trigger was an economic meltdown, which was followed by uh, Lehman Brothers Finance House, which collapsed in September 2008, when it filed for bankruptcy. But we know that the issues were far much deeper and uh, they were related to uh, mortgage loans, uh, you know, mortgage-based securities. There was excessive risk taking when the macroeconomic environment was favorable or when the United States of America is experiencing a pool. So uh, a large share of such risky borrowing was done by investors seeking to make a short term to make short term profits by flipping houses and by subprime borrowers we, who had a hard default risk when these people were laid off they were not able to to continue servicing their mortgages and uh, the overlying which is the mortgage based securities they collapsed in terms of their prices so banks and other lenders were willing to make increasingly large volumes of risky loans for a range of reasons. Competition increased between individual lenders to extend ever larger amounts of housing loans. 
So because the economy was good, it seemed very profitable at the time. But this mortgage, this led to a collapse in the trading of mortgage-based securities. And eventually, there was a serious you know, credit crunch in the United States of America. There was increased borrowing by banks and investors, especially in the United States of America. They were borrowing money to purchase an asset. And this increased their leverage, which tended to magnify profits, but also magnified potential losses. When house prices began to fall, because there's nothing which can rise forever. In Sona, in Sona Dixon, they've got a, a saying. I don't know whether it's a proverb or it's just a wise saying. But they say, Chino Puruga, Chino, ma, chino Mara, Chino Puruga, Chino Mara, which when directly translated, it means whatever flies high, it has to land somewhere. When a bird is flying, it has to land somewhere. You can't have a bird which is flying forever, or an aeroplane, which is flying forever, it has to land somewhere. So the house prices which were rising, at a certain point, they backed the trend, and then they started to fall. So banks and investors who had betted on house prices continuing to rise into the future, they started to incur large losses because they had borrowed so much. So very big banks they found themselves having a very serious credit crisis so overnight uh, banks could not service their loans so how the global financial crisis un unfolded in the short short run u.s prices began to fall borrowers missed their repayments and then the catalyst for the global were falling u.s US house prices and the rising number of borrowers unable to repay their loans. So banks were forced to foreclose on a mortgage agreements, but they were stuck with houses which no one could buy because people were being laid off and the construction industry started to suffer and then there was massive unemployment, downstream unemployment. And this led to very severe stress uh, in the financial system leading to bailouts. And then the crisis was spilled over to other countries. When you carry out what we call a dynamic conditional correlation start, it's a, it's a kind of a volatility start. We, uh, I and another colleague have published a paper mainly on BRICS countries where we're looking at spillovers between Russia and another economy. Uh, you realize that um, uh, there was massive spillover from this crisis that started in the United States of America to other economies, be they BRICS economies, ECOWAS economies, ASEAN economies, SATIC economies, and so on. And then failure of financial firms. There was panic in financial markets because financial firms, they trade on information. Information is like a real asset, it's almost like something which is tangible, you see. So when Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008, it, it caused financial market players to, to panic globally, not just in the United States of America. Invest, investors started to pull their money out of banks and the mutual funds or investment funds and the this caused a very serious credit crunch that that government had to step in to bail out uh, banks. So the responses, the policy responses, they included the institution of low int lower interest rates to inject liquidity to stress the financial markets. So as to uh, stop a situation where the global financial crisis would become a global economic depression which was going to be worse than just the financial crisis which was experienced. So there was increased government spending, deficit spending during the years when 
President Barack Obama was president of the United States of America. In fact, when he started his presidency, that's when the global financial crisis was at its peak. And he was actually forced to pick the mop and mop uh, the, the consequences of the global financial crisis. Though, to flip the pan, he had to actually inject liquidity, not to mop excess liquidity as it were, in order to keep, you know, these large banks that were overexposed to the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, to, to prevent them from completely collapsing, thereby leading to a global, I mean, leading to a, a global economic depression. So stronger oversight of financial firms was instituted, notably by institutions such as the Bank of International Settlements and the uh, different revisions of the Basel and Courts. You can investigate how the different pillars of the Basel and Coin were actually strengthened post GFC, post global financial crisis. So for today, my presentation is ending here. It was a marathon presentation, but uh, as is the norm with me, after editing these notes, I'm going to email you. And in this regard, I'm talking to the students that I'm taking for the module on central banking and monetary economics. Uh, those of uh, the people, our members who are following my channel, uh, who are just listening into these notes in order to gain just knowledge, you, you can investigate some of these issues from the internet, just using your search engine. And uh, uh, I, I will in the near future, we'll create a website where I will be posting some of these materials. But uh, for the time being, it's just uh, these uh, lecture videos that I'm offering. Thank you so much for listening in. Uh, it was a, a good experience. I sharing with you this material. I believe that you benefited from my uh, you know, presentation. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed to my channel and to share this material with those in your circle. Thank you so much.